Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, I'm excited to be joined by coach developers, Dr. Lowell Collins and Dr. Mike Ashford. Welcome, gents. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for having us, Dan. Really excited to have you on today and talk to you about all things coaching. Mike, it's a case of welcome back. Lowell, it's it's great to meet you. This is the first time we've met. Let's let's introduce yourselves to the Sports Soap Show audience. Um, Lowell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, th- thanks, Dan. Hi, uh, my name's Lowell. Um, I'm an adventure sports coach, actually. Um, my background uh, 35 years ago was in outdoor education. Uh, and then as I progressed my career, uh, became more focused on the coaching of uh, of adventure sports. Uh, so th- those are the adventure versions of, of whitewater kayaking, sea kayaking, skiing, climbing. Um, uh, about ten years ago, I realised there was a bit of a gap in my uh, in my knowledge. Uh, I'd been very much a, a field based coach um, for for a long period, um, and I redirected my career into uh, into academia. Um, combination of worn out body uh, damage to my back and my neck and things Um, and then uh, started unpicking really what what coaches do in the field and how they coach. It sounds like a fascinating journey and as you entered into academia you know you speak of unpicking what coaches do Um, at that time were you seriously reflecting back on how you personally coached was it a case of I wish I hadn't have done that why did I do that was it a realization that you could have done things differently or better that that's been a part of my coaching since I started um you know 30 years ago uh, I found myself going through probably like a lot of coaches um a lot of the NGB uh, coach development programs uh, and then the minute I got out and was faced with someone on a whitewater river or uh, whilst we were climbing, discovering that a sing- single approach never really worked. Um, and I, I found myself having to become creative uh, and flexible in my work, really, because I've got two really dynamic things interacting. One is the person I'm coaching and the other is um, what are frequently very, very dynamic environments. Um, so it's a, it, yeah. It, it, it's a question of uh, 30 years trying it out and then going, I wonder if there's any science behind this. <laughs> well, you've teased us into what we're going to be predominantly talking about today. Uh, but before we, we dive deep into that critical thinking, let's uh, reintroduce Mike Ashford to the Sports Site Show audience. Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'll, I'll keep mine brief. Um, I'm former rugby coach, um, student of sports coaching over over the past uh, 12, 13 years. I'm currently a lecturer at Edinburgh University in sports coaching, and I'm also a coach developer working across an array of sports. Um, research interests specifically in rugby union um, around coaching, coach development, skill acquisition. However, work branches out into all, all forms and contexts of sport and coaching. And... You came on the Sports Social at the beginning of 2021, if I recall correctly, and we spoke about a paper you'd done on decision-making in rugby union. I think it was a part of your PhD, which you were doing at the time. And um, I believe, I believe I've heard in dispatches that that's been quite a popular paper, hasn't it? It's sort of, it's, it, it's featured in some top, kind of top 10. Tell us a little bit about how well that paper's doing. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, we actually recorded it at a similar time yeah, to this. I think. I think. Like, yeah. yeah, it's like a year. It's like an annual review. Um, but no, the the systematic literature review. So the the exploration of the three different research perspectives um, has reached quite a wide scope, um, both from a critical point of view and from a positive point of view. I think. But um, so yeah, as a paper, it's definitely had quite a broad reach, and hopefully, it continues to provoke some 
discourse and discussion as it continues on. Well, I know it was a really popular episode and it's a paper I keep coming back to because it's so relevant um, to my consultancy practice. And when I'm watching whether it's footballers practice and train or rugby players practice and train, I've always got in my mind Mike's paper on, on decision making. So uh, and, it, and it's 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 sparked great conversation between myself and, um, and coaches. So th- thank you so much for that. But today we're here to talk about um, well, we're here to talk about another paper, but we've agreed we're going to kind of use the paper as a, a launch pad to have a, a broader conversation around I think, critical thinking in coaching and and um, considering coaching from uh, different lenses within different context. And the title of your paper, as always, I, I find these um, I'm keen uh, followers of both your Twitter feeds and uh, often you find some real gold dust on Twitter feeds and I I came across this uh, when it got published. Um, it's entitled, It Depends Coaching, the most fundamental, simple and complex principle or a mere cop-out is the question that you pose uh, in the title of the paper. It depends coaching. We're going to be talking uh, professional judgment and decision making. And when we were uh, in the, in the lead up to to recording this episode, we were having a little bit of a chat, weren't we, Mike and Lowell, about how we could how we could uh, introduce this to the audience. And 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 I said to you guys that I, I wanted to start by, I suppose, expressing my understanding of the paper and what you're saying. And and so if you can afford me a couple of minutes just to allow me to allow me to explain what I think about this paper or or what what I think this paper is about, Um, I'll do so. So in my own playbook right now, in my own consultancy playbook, um, I'm consulting with a couple of football teams, I'm consulting in esports, I'm consulting with a range of individuals, Um, uh, one in boxing, one in UFC, tennis, golf, across a range of sports. Um, uh, multiple teams within sports, multiple uh, teams across a range of sports. And so my challenge is to go into environments and work out what I need to do in order to help my clients um, be the best that they can be, to have a look at that landscape and decide, okay, what do I need to do? And it just so happens that every time I enter into an environment or every time I enter into a relationship with a client, that landscape is always different. It's always complex. It's never the same. It always requires me to ask the right questions, to take different lenses of the world, and then to work out the right approaches, the right frameworks, the right theories, the right tools and techniques that might fit my client, whether it's an individual client or a team uh, or a club or an organization um, that I'm uh, about to be embedded into. That's my understanding of what you're speaking to in this paper. It depends coaching is very much, we might have knowledge as coaches, but that knowledge uh, depends how we use that knowledge and what knowledge we do use depends on the context that we find ourselves in. Am I reading this correctly? Yes, I I think broadly you've got to grips with it uh, there, which which is great. I mean, the, the, the challenge here is is that coaching is a, for me, is very much a decision-making process. Uh, I, I have to identify the best way I can work with that individual in that environment for them to improve. Um, uh, and that, that means I need a set of skills and a set of options to select from. Okay. Um, you know, my, my, my original work is on, in judgment and, and decision making uh, on this side of things. Um, and that's dependent upon understanding the full context of that coaching interaction. You know, the environment in which you coach and the person that you are uh, working with to develop. And so th- those two things work um, in isolation, but they also work in synergy with each other. And if you imagine it, the environments we coach in are infinitely variable. The people we coach are infinitely variable. Uh, And so you need to be adaptable and flexible and capable of of creating the optimum tool for them to develop. 
So, yeah, I, I think you've got it there. Yeah, I'd just jump onto that as well. I think one of the key things there is this idea of context. Um, and the, the connection between context and knowledge forms is extremely important. Um, I, I like to use the phrase meeting meeting participants or clients or, or players where they are in order to get them to where they want to get, end up. And I think it's that that conditionality, that subjectiveness that's so important towards venturing towards expertise um, is that is that conditionality of what can I apply here to really suit the needs of the individual, but not just the needs of the individual, also the needs of the environment of what's progressing in front of us. So if I was to take a real world example right now, Steve Borthwick has just left Leicester Rugby, if we're looking at British sport to return to England this time as head coach, taking over from Eddie Jones. My assumption is that he's not necessarily, necessarily going to be able to take the same approach, the same frameworks, the same tools, the same techniques as he did at Leicester, where he's been highly successful um, for the season or seasons he's had there since he originally left England rugby and take them into England. He may be able to take some things. He may be able to take lots of things, but he may not be able to take everything and he may not be able to take a lot of things. These are different contexts with different challenges. And so subsequently, what where he's going to be tested in this situation is his capacity to flex and decide what is crucial for that the specific context he's going to be finding himself in that that would feel like a real world solution from professional elite professional sport right now yeah absolutely if i could jump in there i guess the the beauty of that example is the fact that when it comes down to the performance of Mm. those two environments on the pitch it looks exactly the same it's still still 15 men with seven on the bench going to try and beat an opponent that's in front of them. But inherently, those two contexts are completely different. On one side, the former, it's a context where you are you are in collaboration with one another on one another on a weekly basis over the duration of the season. Your interactions are much more frequent. The context itself allows you to create a social cohesion that might not exist elsewhere. So all of a sudden, it's it, we're talking about two different beasts here. Whereas in an international setting, the context all in itself creates huge social barriers uh, by bringing in players from different contexts. So therefore, just by con- by going in and considering the end in mind and working backwards from there, you have huge social barriers to overcome to enable a group of players to interact positively in order to perform. Um, so again, that that nuance between the context provides huge considerations of what tools, what methods, what things are actually going to work to meet their intended goals when once it comes to it. It feels messy. It sounds messy. It sounds chaotic. I mean, that's the thing I'd I'd say. Almost, it, it's not a pushback, but it's just a reflection on what you're both saying and what you're both suggesting. I feel people might be listening in and saying, well, hang on, yeah, but I, okay, yeah, there's some different contexts, but surely he can bend and manoeuvre what he does already if we, we're going to keep on the Steve Borthwick uh, uh, focus here. Surely there's enough enough leeway and enough capacity to bend what he does already and shape it into the environment that he's about to enter. Surely that's the case. Uh, and if he doesn't, then uh, and if he's unable to do that, then surely um, he's going to fail. Um, this messiness, this chaos is surely something that we have to eliminate by knowing how we like to coach, knowing what works for us and just doing that. Well, I, I, I think your point's an interesting one. Um, I mean, let's, if, we, if we're completely frank, coaching is really complicated stuff. It's, it's a social interaction uh, which has a, a, a particular, you know, a desired outcome at the end of it, the development of the individual that we're working with. So I, th- I think it, it, it's your classic um, Einstein, isn't it? Make, make, make this as simple as it can be, but don't make it simplistic. Um, uh, and I think that embracing the complexity of what we do uh, is an essential 
attribute of, of any good coach. Um, you know, I, if, if I think of the context that I work in, in adventure sports, uh, we have a set of sports that um, are adventurous in their nature. I mean, we used to go, it's climbing, canoeing, skiing, etc. But actually, there are now versions of climbing, versions of paddling, versions of skiing that are Olympic right the way through to the adventurous end of things. So it's how we do the sport uh, and the where we do that sport. And the, the characteristic is that the environments that I've tended to operate in for the last 30 years or so are hyperdynamic. They're continually changing all the time. And my biggest challenge is to coordinate the development of an individual to facilitate that development and also to be able to anticipate how the environment I'm working in is going to adapt and change as well. So I need to get both client, student and environment to coalesce at the right point because when when they want to... Uh, when, when a client says they want to paddle class four white water, um, I, I've got to make sure that they've got to the appropriate skill level and I'm on the river at the right place at the right time to, to run that particular class four. It's messy, you know. Um, uh, and it, the, the other phrase that I think is really good here is that it's a, a wicked problem. And that, that's the academic uh, phrase I, I'd use in that there are multiple factors and solving one factor doesn't always, in fact, it might exacerbate other elements in, in that problem. So I, I'm, I'm with you. It, it's a messy, wicked problem, um, coaching in, in particular. Sorry, I've spoken too much again, Mike. No, no, not at all. I'm just going to be able, like draw back to the, the paper as a reference there. I think we, we, use, um, we use Sean's work and a, a statement that's been cited quite heavily. Um, in coaching literature and this idea that pr- practice is the swampy lowlands, right? <laughs> um, it, it, the, we can talk about best practice as much as we like. And uh, this is the idea of nested planning in the paper as well, is that, that our intentions never really true, uh, truly play out in reality. Something always changes. And that is the beauty of practice is that it is messy. But it's finding order in that messiness. It's finding the judgment in the messiness that is the key. That, that's where coaching really, really comes to the fore is this idea of being able to navigate those swampy lowlands to come to your original intentions in mind, regardless of what environmental constraints are thrown up. I think that, that is the, the key there in, in what we're trying to hit home. So may I ask you this? If we're coaching in the swampy lowlands, if human beings are complex and and games, sports are complicated, and thus we're in the chaos, the mess, the swampy lowlands, surely, surely, guys, my best approach philosophically is to say, okay, I love games-based, so I'm going to become so good. Uh, delivering in games based or I love uh, an instructional model and I'm going to become so good at that I'm going to memorize I'm going to know what Rosenshine instruction to use at any given time I'm going to I'm going to study John Wooden and understand his eclectic range of instructional approaches Uh, coming back to games based I'm going to I'm going to be an expert in game sense and teaching games for understanding and, and be that kind of, dare I say, constructivist coach. Um, surely then, if I make my coaching world consistent, I will make my outer coaching world, I suppose, um, more more palatable. Not may, Maybe not more consistent, but more palatable. I just keep getting better and better and better at what I do. Surely that's the best. Therefore, being in the swampy lowlands, that's the best approach to take. I, I guess first things first there is, uh, I, like, I like the fact you ebbed and flowed between different approaches. And, uh, and I, I like using this term of, uh, they're, they're tools for hire in our practice. Okay. So that the dif- different methods exist to allow us to achieve what we want from practice. Okay. Um, and it, I, 
I can make a judgment on whether that tool or that method. So let, let's let's be specific here and say a coaching approach or a coach behavior or a certain type of learning activity or practice design. I can take those things and hire them in order to, to see whether it's going to work or not. Um, and I guess this idea, Dylan Williams' famous quote of ev- <laughs> everything works somewhere, nothing works everywhere. Um, and it's the, the key there, again, is that conditionality. Mm. Okay, why does it work there and not there? Mm. Um, and I guess m- moving slightly on from that, this idea that just because we intend to use particular tools, just because we might plan for those tools and consider that that might work best in this context that we're going to go into, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the tool and that's the method that plays out in practice. There might be a gap there between our expectations and the reality of what we deliver. And I think it's that gap that can be quite daunting to coaches. Okay. Um, whereas it's like, oh, I've, uh, I've made a mistake. Whereas I guess what we're advocating for is it's that gap that has all that richness, all that possibility in it that can drive forward our practice as we progress. If we can learn from our practice as we're delivering the tools that we use, the conditionality of those tools, and really start to get a critical, reflective judgment on where we head next. I think that's extremely powerful. No? Um, I, I, I might take... I, I agree with Mike uh, on, on a lot of this. I'll, I'll probably take a slightly different perspective on this in that uh, I, I, what you, you, you're describing to me is what I would describe as an adaptive expert. Okay. And, um, you know, the, the original work on that uh, sort of um, by, uh, was it Hatano Inigaki, I think it is, um, they, they, they talk about ex- adaptive expertise being um, a, a logical progression almost from being a routine expert because that expert finds themselves in an environment in which the routines don't always work. You know, a single method, a single approach doesn't work in a given situation. Um, and so for, for me, this is about the way in which we consider expertise as coaches. Uh, and it, it, it's the adaptability, the capacity to be adaptable and flexible, to recognize when a, a routine or a single approach won't suffice in a given situation and thus you you recognize the need to adapt what exists or to create something that's new for that given context that given person in that given environment um so i i I will always tend tend to look at this from from that perspective now that that has an implication for me um in that Hatano and Inigaki talk about adaptive expertise developing on routine expertise. Um, the, the dynamism in the environments that I've worked in would suggest that routine expertise doesn't have a particularly strong place. Um, in fact, those environments, because they're continually changing, continually adapting, the interaction with the individuals in those environments is continually changing and in, uh, interacting you might think of adaptive expertise almost on a spectrum and the more dynamic the environment you operate in the more dynamic that relationship is the more of an adaptive expert you have to become yeah um so yeah it's the nature of expertise is is at the heart of this because then that influences how how i develop coaches to work in those environments yes Sorry, I was just going to make a connection there. But on our previous podcast, Dan, we spoke about the internal logic of the game mm. and how the internal logic of a sport would would drive the level of complexity of decisions that are made within that sport. Yep. I mean, it's exactly the same with what Lowell is discussing there, is that the, the complexity of the environment you're faced with as a coach is going to drive the need to be adaptive. So two ends of the spectrum might be, a gymnastics coach working with an athlete who's on a beam routine. The, the the key is in the name routine. It is a step-by-step process in which they need to achieve. The environment isn't isn't that flexible because it's just them and a beam. Yep. 
with some external pressures, whereas that looks completely different to Lowell's context he's discussing there. Um, I, I just think there's a nice connection to be made there. This idea is it's, it's inherently dependent on the context that we work within. You mentioned routine expertise. I may have missed this. I apologize. What do you mean about, I understand adaptive expertise. So if we go back to my original example, when I talked about learning as much as I can uh, from an instructional perspective and or learning as much as I can from a games-based perspective, if I'm being adaptive, it's essentially learning as much as I can from each approach and, and thus being able to apply um, tools, techniques, approaches uh, from each approach, depending on what the contextual demands uh, require, is routine expertise, essentially when I know lots about instructional coaching, but don't know much about anything else. And I'm, thus, I'm just going to routinely go down the path of instructional coaching. Am I, am I hearing that correctly? Um, I, I, I perhaps wouldn't describe it quite in those terms. For, okay. for me, routine expertise is where an individual is capable of consistently repeating the same thing. Okay. Yeah, whereas adaptive expertise would be the individual's capacity to recognize that the routine doesn't fit or doesn't work or is unlikely to work and then being able to create or adapt the routine to the new context. And are we hierarchically putting adaptive expertise above routine expertise? Uh, right, and the, 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 this is the this is the really interesting bit for me at the moment. The the original um, Hatano Inigaki's work sort of suggested that you had to be a routine expert before you could become an adaptive expert. Um, but I, th I think that's probably a product of where they did their investigations, as in it was an environment in which a routine would suffice to a point. For us in coaching, I, I'm wondering, uh, and uh, I think it's, it's Alice Mises' work on this, um, and there's, there's Jensen Bridges in a recent paper, both talk about the the origins not necessarily having to be in routine. If you're continually working in adaptive environments, uh, environments that require you to be adaptable, actually you can develop as an ad adaptive expert from the start. So the, the, the issue there is I think we sometimes fall into a trap in coach development of unintentionally presenting routines as the way when, when in fact it's a way and and what you have to do is to have the ability to adapt but also to recognize the need to adapt can either of you put in practical terms what routine a uh, routine expertise might look like versus uh, adaptive expertise i guess um I often use an example. It's not actually from coaching, though. I use an example from medicine. It's a great video of Barack Rosenstein talking okay. about a, an experiment that he did between endocrinologists and cardiologists. Okay. And he talks about this idea of higher thinking skills and that everyone should have higher thinking skills and expertise and the ability to adapt. And he basically gives expert cardiologists um, a test to do against sub-experts. And then the same for the endocrinologists in their own field. And basically, obviously, the experts outperform the novices. They're able to chunk information. They're able to consider the, the methods and tools that they're going to use in order to come to the premises and the, the overall diagnosis. However, then they flip it on its head and they give the experts and sub-experts of the cardiology group the endocrinology problems and vice versa. And the experts perform worse than the novices because they they basically aim to use the same methods and tools that have been developed in their own routine area. And they're unable to adapt to the problems that are posed because the knowledge base isn't there. So that almost by being an expert, a routine expert in that particular area, they're then un unable to adapt to the, the demands of that particular environment. I don't know if that answers that question, but lol, over to you, mate. Yeah, I mean, the, 
the bit that becomes important uh, again in this is that the those routines are clearly fixed but when you look at adaptive experts they use the component parts of those routines but they reconfigure them they they bring them together in different ways to find the solution to the problem uh, so there there's, there are a couple of characteristics in there which are, for me I, I think are really exciting in that those component parts, there tends to be fewer component parts, but those component parts are interchangeable. And there's a characteristic of those parts, which which is probably where I'm going to go with my research next, I think, because it, it, keep, it keep, keeps me, gets me excited, is that those parts are interchangeable. They're like universal pieces in a jigsaw set that, that come together. So you have the components, but there are characteristics of those components as well. So they can be interchanged with each other, um, which I think is, is really exciting. The, the challenge there is that we've historically delivered routines, asked people to provide a routine. Um, and those bits can't or the routine can't always be taken apart and the bits are not always interchangeable so there there's a a characteristic in in how the adaptive expert views the components of the knowledge that they have as well that's really fascinating and and mike if i was to take what lowell says and draw upon your experiences as a rugby coach for example and again please use your own examples if i'm if i'm uh, if I'm choosing some here that don't illustrate Lowell's point, you know, I'm assuming as a rugby coach, when you started first coaching and learning how to coach, there might be a way when we think of routine, a way of coaching a line out or coaching a scrum that you were like, yeah, this is how I'm going to coach a scrum or a line out. And maybe over a period of time, um, what we're saying about adaptable expertise is you found different ways, whether it's from different sources, different coaches, whether it's from reading, whether it's from, you know, research that you read uh, to uh, differentiate perhaps how you might coach a line out or a scrum. Is that sort of at the coalface what we're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, it it's interesting there because what we're talking about is it is how we interact with new and novel knowledge forms mm. so if, if if i as a rugby coach uh just happen to have a real nice coach education experience or development experience around how to shape practice in order to mis- meet desired intentions so let's say for instance and there's some skill acquisition principles that are provided around practice design and all of a sudden that resonates with me I then have a routine to think about how I might coach the scrum or I might coach the line out. But by zooming in and, and taking that knowledge and applying it in a dualistic, almost absolute fashion, I then miss the subtle nuances of each of the individuals that I'm coaching in that particular session. Their biopsychosocial needs, are they motivated in the first place to engage in a practice around the scrum and the line out? And I, I, I'm not even aware that they have a biopsychosocial makeup because I haven't interacted with that knowledge form yet. So therefore, I'm just ill-equipped to even respond to that type of behaviour. So it, it, interestingly, as humans, initially, when we interact new knowledge, we tend to view it as absolute because it gives us something to work with. But then as we receive newer forms of knowledge and perhaps deeper, more complex forms of knowledge, and I think, Lowell, correct me if I'm wrong here, that's where these piecing of component parts comes in. That's where the subtlety and that conditionality of knowledge, I think we call it pragmatic knowledge in the paper particularly, that's where that that becomes so powerful. Um, But additionally, I don't think that initial meeting of novel knowledge in an absolute fashion is a bad thing. Because I think it allows us to start. It allows us to to pave a way to become an ex, to become an expert coach. Gives us something to think about and to refer back to. As you were speaking there, it was making me think of um, the work in psychology of inattentional blindness. 
And if you think of the experiments around, I think most people listening in would have seen that classic uh, gorilla experiment with the players throwing the basketball and the gorilla coming across. And if obviously the idea of the experiment is to count the number of passes that were being made uh, by the players, you would miss the gorilla. That is something called inattentional blindness. And what I'm hearing you say there is if from day dot and onwards we engage in routine knowledge alone, perhaps simply put one way, one way, one way, one way, irrespective of how knowledgeable we become of of that one way and irrespective of how good we become of delivering that one way, we are going to miss if we if we haven't got a broad knowledge base of biopsychosocially, technically, tactically, physically, the broader and deeper our knowledge base, the more we turn down the risk of inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness will probably always be there because we're human beings. We can't know everything about everything. But um, essentially, it almost feels like an overarching principle of good coaching is to turn down a volume of inattentional blindness. I've just made that overarching principle up. But I, I think you've got a, a really good point there. Um, and it, in, in particular, if we bring this back to, to the paper, that, that's where uh, the it depends is, is an overarching thing. It, it's, not, uh, it's not to replace. It's to uh, create a, an environment in which the coach can look at the multiple interrelating factors and use those to inform a decision as to wh- what option to select for a given situation. So in, in that way, it depends, embraces a whole load of different methods and approaches based on the judgment and the decision uh, and the desire to select the optimal uh, strategy for for the persons for the individual's development. Yeah. In order to make that judgment, though, you've got to know what you're looking for in the first instance, or or listening for, yep. or feeling for. And I guess um, a lot of this work in both learning in both education settings and coaching settings is drawn out the work of Chase and Simon and De Groot back in like the 1960s in chess around situational probability, around pattern recognition. And there's a great quote that comes out of that work, which um, Kirshner and Clark have used in their recent work, which is this idea of what we know determines what we see. But it's not also what we see, it's what we feel and what we hear. Um, And with the inattentional blindness piece, if we don't have the knowledge form, we're going to miss so much. We're not going. We're not going to be aware that there are elements in the environment and in the practice environment that we're just unaware of because we don't have that knowledge to see it in the first place. Um, the, I'll, I'll speak about this because when I was doing my masters, Andy Abraham used to do a great task with us, which was this idea of watching um, each individual would bring in a clip from their own sport uh, of the actual sport being played, and we and we were asked to comment on their sport from a position of a lack of knowledge, of limited knowledge in that particular area. And so obviously you'd notice very particular things, technical things, tactical things. You might try and reach further than the knowledge form that you have. Yeah. Then all of a sudden the, the person who bought the clip in it can then offer more, more insight, deeper knowledge. And that knowledge structure is so, so much further, so much deeper. They're so much more aware of what they're looking for in that particular sport. I think that idea of what we know determines what we see is an extremely prevalent idea in coaching, especially from an adaptive expertise point of view. Because if you don't see it, you're not going to adapt. As you're speaking there, it reminds me of my ongoing challenge, I suppose, as a sports psychologist. And there's two challenges rolled into one here, a professional challenge and a personal challenge. The professional challenge is working in environments where I I believe that coaches are so heavily socialised into tech tech and thus they are viewing one lens of the world probably more than one lens but go with an external lens they're viewing behavior and thus have behavioral solutions uh as in 
tech tech solutions for that situation and missing an enormous complex human system biopsychosocial piece which actually could be an underpinning cause or at least correlated in some way to the behaviors that they're seeing but then i'm going to move on to a second challenge is me not being too biased towards that biopsychosocial challenge because every single day of my life in many respects I'm tr- I'm trying to I am trying to convince and persuade whilst being com- careful about convincing and persuading and not going too far because I think again that socialization of we're just going to change behavior change behavior change behavior when there are other tools potentially to utilize biopsychosocially that can then influence behavior um, I'm saying that every single day I'm saying that every single day. And so I can become really biased by that when actually a, a, a solution I might suggest is biopsychosocial and actually the coaching solution in that instance, in that context, context with that person is actually probably or, or could be could be could be the tactical solution or the behavioral solution, if you like. So, um yeah, there's, there's no question, but that's a, that was what was going on in the, my mind there is I'm I, as a sports psychologist, I'm constantly having a, a yin and yang in my mind uh, uh, um, in terms of going in different directions and I've got to I've got to be careful I've got to be careful that I'm not going to be swayed by my cognitive bias that I'm not going to be subject to inattentional blindness I guess um, there's a piece of work that really resonates with me as you were chatting there Dan around this idea of assumptions um and there's a, a piece of work done by Strain and colleagues back in the 90s around this idea of paradigmatic assumptions so that we can make assumptions that we believe to be true and therefore they become tightly held as beliefs. Uh, and that that's where bias really comes to the fore in terms of what we prioritise and what we privilege when we look for things. Um now, what they suggest is that experts are able to tap into those paradigmatic assumptions and that tacit knowledge form and bring it to the surface to be aware of them and check impulses and to almost mentally rehearse. Well, if I, if I, if I play this bias through, what, what, what's the actual intended consequences here? Lol, you've got your hand up there. Probably a good time to tag team. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, again, the the bit for me here is is the level of thinking that's associated with this, um, and we we see that coaches who are very good at making good judgments have a meta process that works here that enables them to cons- to ask themselves: Are they thinking about this problem in the right way? Am I making the decision in the right way? Should I trust my gut feel here when I look across that so snow slope and I want to work out whether it's going to avalanche or not? Or should I take a more classic approach and go how much snow, what direction was the wind, how much snow has been building up on here in the last six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours? Uh, and so we see good expert judgment and decision makers think about how they make the decision and in order to do that they have to unpack that hidden knowledge the tacit knowledge which they don't know they know and bring that to the fore so that it becomes part of the process so we we see linked really closely with effective judgment decision making in coaches but actually across a whole range of fields the capacity to reflect on action, in action, and on action in context. And that's an essential skill. Now, it, it, it's really interesting. Uh, I think it, it's Christine Nash published recently on the fact that coaches don't always consider themselves to be reflective practitioners. And that there's a really interesting point there because what you what i think the coaches are actually recognizing is that reflection is in, so integral to the coaching process that all that on action reflection stuff that we might give them in a coach ed course they go I, d- I don't think that's relevant because i do all my thinking in the field i do all my thinking on the water or on on my skis so at the end of the day 
I don't do the on action reflection stuff. I've done all my reflection in the moment, in the decision to improve the, the client's ability. So there's, there's a very high level of cognitive process for coaches uh, in here uh, would, would be the point I'd make. Metacognition, thinking about thinking, yeah. thinking about behaviours. Just dwelling briefly on action. I do want to, I mean, we are talking about this paper and I do want to come back to the specifics of the paper in a second, but um, on action, when you say um, there's, there's coaches who would suggest that they are doing their thinking on the pitch or on the water or wherever their performance environment is. Um, what does thinking on action look like if it's not in the environment? I'm slightly misunderstanding that. Okay. So um, the, the inaction, the inaction reflection is in the context, is the decision associated directly with the coaching. The on-action reflection are a lot of those processes that we see that happen post-activity. Uh, and so you see all those models of on-action reflection. And I, th I think those get put forwards in coach development programs. And in particular, the experienced coaches go, no, no, that, that doesn't apply because I do my thinking on the water, on the pitch. Yep. And so there's the disconnect there. And so they don't perceive themselves to be reflective practitioners, but it's because they do their reflection in, in the action. Now, alongside that, and it, this is one of the differences, uh, we found with the adventure sports coaches that they create opportunities for that reflection as well in the context and some of those can be opportunist as in my group need to stop uh, and change their kit because they're sweating too much as we're, we're heading up this slope uh, my group need to drink some water i'll take the moment whilst they're doing that to think about what's going on here or the coach actually uses strategies that creates time so they use pedagogic approaches that have the individuals going away and comparing different performances because of different factors in different situations. Or they go, I tell you what, you just need to practice now. Go, go away and do five cycles and then come back. So the coaches create or grab these opportunities for this in-session thinking, this in-session reflection. Did I answer your question, Dan, or did I get sidetracked? I tend to get sidetracked. No, you, cer you certainly did. It was brilliant. And, and I suppose I've got another question because I, I, returning to the paper, um, and all of that is in the paper, so let's be clear about that. But, I, 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 you know, the paper was written by both of you, yourselves and uh, led by Dave Collins on this and uh, ably assisted by Jamie Taylor. Um, and... It feels like, and I think you overtly say this in the paper, that you've written this paper about it depends coaching, otherwise known as professional judgment and decision making. As a coach, I need to professionally judge. I need to make effective decisions um, within my context, uh, the, 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 the specific challenges within my context. And I think perhaps what it seems to me from reading the paper is that that position has been challenged by people saying, well, this is a bit fluffy and it's a bit okay, but it's not concrete enough. Where do you start here? And it, it, you're proposing in this paper three constructs within professional judgment and decision making um, that coaches can, that can guide coaches is what I'm understanding one of which is adaptive expertise that we've spoken about quite a lot another one is something called nested thinking or nested planning and I urge everybody listening in to read the paper to understand this further but uh, the on action and the inaction the reflective stuff is that part of the nested thinking and nested planning and and can you gentlemen sort of take us through what nested thinking and nested planning is yeah, so um, you're right, that that thinking is actually a process that stretches across all those, the three legs to that particular stool, all, all those three themes. Mm. Um, 
Uh, now, it, in terms of the planning and the nested thinking, this this is a concept that uh, the the way I I would explain this is that a single decision has an impact uh, up and down the food chain, up and down the coaching process. So I might make a decision uh, that uh, has an immediate effect. I'll, I'll use an example from my, my own field, a decision yeah, not to take helmets on a canoe trip, okay. for, for instance, um, on a whitewater canoe trip. Uh, and I can choose to do that, but it immediately has a, an influence down the process in that when I get to a hard stretch of white water, I've actually already made the decision I'm not going to be running it with those clients. And it, it has an impact up the process to the, the macro level as to the level or the river that I might choose or when I might choose to be on that river, you know, in the morning, later in the season or whatever. So it, it's the fact that a single decision affects up and down the entire planning process. Um, and, and that's that's an important construct. And it, it works for, for me within adventure in that kind of example, um, but it, it works equally in a longer coaching cycle, um, it, you know, where you're con considering the, the, uh, the seasonality, the, the weekly, the monthly, uh, and the micro interaction. I'll, you'll probably be good at taking that a bit further, Mike. Well, I was just thinking it's a nice opportunity to draw back to the example of Steve Borthwick mentioned earlier on today. Um, rugby. Yeah, because um, all of a sudden the context throws up that there's 18 months through until the World Cup, which means that that 18 months now provides a, a longer term vision as to where they want to be by the time they go to that tournament. And just by its simple nature, by beginning with the end in mind and thinking about that end, you can reverse engineer back from there and start to think about sources of knowledge that we're going to use in order to drive what this is going to look like. Periodizing when they're going to have training camps and what's the purpose of those training camps. Thinking about individual coaches' role clarity and what 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 roles and responsibilities they're going to take charge of in order to create knowledge transfer through to the playing group and their role clarity that they possess. And I guess in the same way, Lowell was talking about this ebbing and flowing between a, a, a moment in time yeah. of a decision at that particular time. Is that coherent and integrated with that end in mind over the longer term? And uh, that's where the three ideas in the paper all interlink because if I've got that end in mind, I've got a useful guide now from a nested plan point of view. I've got a useful guide of where we're going to get to. We've got a clear insight as to where those learning opportunities take place. However, I've also then considered what knowledge, the types of knowledge, the tools, the methods that we're going to use in to, to achieve that end in mind. But then in that moment in time, like uh, in the paper, we, we say that coaches aren't omniscient and planning is a useful guide because no plan really. What, what was it you said, Lowell? What was the example you gave the other day? No plan lasts. No, no plan survives first contact. It's, it's an old military adage. <laughs> but it, it helps us to adapt because we have a reference point. And that's why that nested thinking really comes to the fore. And in essence, when we're engaging in nested thinking, we're immediately engaging in reflection in action through the nested planning process of where we're trying to get to in the long run. So it's this idea that that nested planning and thinking allows all three ideas to come to the fore as at, at that particular moment when we're making a judgment and when we're making a decision. If that answers the question, Dan. No, it does. It's... Uh, my mind is abuzz with thoughts. I mean, that just the first thing that pops into my head is from my own experience, sometimes speaking with football coaches who are coaching at a very elite level, let's say they're in the English Championship. And, um, you know, when you talk about beginning with the end, uh, with the end in mind, Mike, I can think of so many examples, but say in a championship where you've got a, a potential pl a game worth £170 million to the organisation, you're sitting there in, I don't know, July and August, 
pre-season or just as the season is starting. And um, I, I've, I've, I'm sure there are coaches out there who do this, but I've not necessarily met a coach who sat down with me and said, we might get into the playoffs and we might be playing uh, playing the biggest game of our life in nine months' time or eight months' time. And uh, we need to think about what that looks like and how we're going to plan for that. And, and actually doing that help may potentially help us get there. It was a, it's a random example, but it just popped into my head. And, it, and it's, uh, I, th- I love that. I've always loved the idea of beginning with the end in mind. And I'm not saying it's the predominant philosophy that, that flows through nested thinking, but it, it, it's... Um, uh, or, or planning, I should say, but it's begin with the end in mind and then break that down into to macro and micro uh, units, if you like. And it's very relevant for me as a sports psychologist in terms of any sports psychologist fitting into um, an organization, a club, a team, um, the decisions that the head coach makes uh whether it's for the sports psychologist in terms of how they want to use a sports psychologist uh, or the co-creation of that uh, position is so, so important and uh, influences behaviours and decisions and uh, planning two, three, four, five, six months uh, 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 ahead. No question, guys, but just th- just some thoughts from my end. It's, it's, it's the coherence, uh, I think, is the, is the essential bit here is that, that, that there is a clear coherence between the big scale decision, the mid scale decision and the micro decision. Yeah. And of course, if you, if you understand what it is um, that you are uh, attempting to achieve uh, at the end of the process, when it all goes, when the plan doesn't survive first mm. contact at that micro level, you still have the direction that you're traveling. And, and so the, the mid-level decision and the macro decision are still coherent, even though you have to change the micro decision depending on the context. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, the, I, I was working with some guides um, in, in Finland, actually, a couple of weeks ago, and they, they described this as when you're moving on a bearing across uh, some ice pack, you have to clearly know where you're going to and you clearly know the bearing, but you can deviate on the bearing uh, as you go around different ice ridges and different compression points in the ice and come back onto the bearing. And it's, I thought that was a lovely analogy. Does that work? <laughs> it, it, it does for me. Before you come in here, Mike, I mean, it's very relevant for me right now. And, and I'm going to take this, you know, a plan, you know, that never survives first contact but I'll, I'll shift it slightly and talk about this from a win-loss perspective, okay, which, um, which isn't the point. But, for instance, I'm in a consultancy with a, a professional football team at the moment where and it, if you take it from winning and losing, we, won, we, we survived the first contact, we've survived the second contact, we've, we've not survived the third contact. Um, and now it causes us to have... But the beauty is we've created coherence, horizontal coherence across the team with shared language around uh, the psychological side of things. And, And now what we can do is we can keep the same bearing after that mini loss, if you like, but we do have to maneuver a little bit because we have to have good conversation as to why we lost that that third contact if you like we lost the game right so we now have to have good conversation now we're not going to go off in a completely different bearing because we've got this horizontal coherence we're talking the same language we're using together across the team we're using mental skills but what we now know is ah we need to be this person needs to be slightly better at doing this and that that the team needs to be a little bit more coherent about understanding this uh, element of mental skill in this situation here uh, and and so that's how i'm intellectualizing this in my mind in my in one of my worlds right now uh in my in my consultancy practice is i'm going to keep the same bearing and that's really powerful because we've got that coherence but there's but we've just got to maneuver a little bit to accommodate individual differences and uh, mini group differences within the wider group. That's kind of how I'm intellectualizing that. If I jump on that from an example from a team sport, 
yeah. um, example. We all know that the, this, the end in mind, the particular aims and objectives, it might be to win more than we lose at the end of the season. It might be to gain promotion, whatever they are. That's a, a shining light, right? A guiding star to all, all the things that, that occur on a weekly basis. And I guess uh, it's always good to look at critical errors in this, in this area. When we consider expertise, critical errors allow us to move forwards. But one critical error that I am very aware of is that, that coaches can often t- chase too many cats on a weekly basis. And that's where I think the distinction between this idea of goals and objectives, which have often been synonymous with coaching, and the difference between intentions for impact become extremely powerful. Because the intentions for impact can have a broader umbrella towards the overall intentions in the long run, which allows us to be more flexible, more adaptable on a weekly basis. And then we can hold a more tighter aim on a week where we can have one or two areas of focus that allow us to really zoom in on the opponent that we might be facing that weekend or an opponent in three weeks' time who we know is going to cause us some real issues. And so it's not suggesting that variability is a bad thing. It's actually making an informed judgment of the amount of variability that can occur on a weekly basis in line with that guiding star, that shining light that's, that we're really working towards. So I think that that work initially was done by Martin Dale and Collins back in 2005, this idea of creating what impact do you want to create through your intentions? What are we really going after here? And how do we ensure alignment and coherence to that in those intentions? And what's the accepted level of variability that is appropriate given where we're heading towards? Makes me think of the word clarity, having clarity in what you're doing. Listen, we, 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 we've talked about two of the three constructs that you are placing within professional judgment and decision making to make it, um, uh, whether it's a little bit more, a little bit clearer for people or whether it's that they act as uh, uh, efficacious guides for those who want to engage in professional judgment and decision making who like the it depends approach and um, there is a third i do have i'm mindful of both of your times and i do have a final question to ask you um but it, do you want to briefly run us through what and i think we've alluded to some some of this already but what that a uh, third um, construct is we've got nested thinking and planning we've got adaptive expertise what's a third guide that you've got for those utilizing professional judgment decision making model i guess um we we've we've referred to it previously but the basically the nature and use of knowledge um and uh, as i spoke earlier that that humans have almost like a rule of thumb when we engage with new and novel knowledge, which is to go, wow, that really interests me. That is meaningful to me. Therefore, I'm going to apply it. Um, Dave and Rosie did some work back in 2013, which was a paper titled Of Vampires and Wolves. And it draws on the work of, uh, of Noel Entwistle and Peterson back in 2004 from an education setting where they talk about the interaction with new knowledge in in students, young students, being quite dualistic in nature. So that when I receive new knowledge, I then go, I'm going to dualistically apply this everywhere because it makes sense to me. But then as I receive newer forms of knowledge, maybe deeper, more critical forms of knowledge, I start to experience that there are multiple sources of knowledge that I can select from. And that leads us to a bit of a threshold where we can either go back to what we held true. So we can go back to the things that have worked for us in the past, that that dualistic nature, or we can start to appreciate the contextual nuances and novelties that exist in our context, the challenges that might arise. And then we can progress through that threshold towards this idea of being relativistic. And that's that idea of what works for that individual or that team in that context and why. That's where that judgment and decision-making really comes to the fore. So if you use a practical example, if, I, if I've got that relativistic nature, I've, I've, I've engaged with multiple sources, I've looked at the evidence that underpin them and the context of where that evidence has come from, from literature or through podcasts, 
And I've therefore got a, an array of tools available for hiring my practice. And we come to that one decision of adaptive expertise. Am I? Uh, do I immediately know what tool to pick and use based on my situational awareness, based on the information I'm collecting from that data? And that's what we talk about with the nature and use of knowledge, which is pragmatically what tool is going to be best for me to apply based on the environment, based on the needs of the individuals. And how am I going to work if I've got co-coaches? How am I going to then employ that method in practice? And that, that's why when we talk about coaching being inherently complex, the swampy lowlands, it's that ability to employ knowledge at that time that makes it so complex. Lol, I don't know if you want to jump in there. Um, I, I think this, this bit on the knowledge is, is super important actually because uh, p- part of the part of the problem that you can run into is that uh, we, we collect a whole load of knowledge through different sources as we go through our lives uh, and so it's not in this process that the it depends process that we consider absolutely everything because that paralyzes us mm. what what actually happens is we understand sufficiently the context of our work and we're considering a reduced number yeah. of appropriate options. Um, you know, may, maybe four or five realistic options uh, that, that we make the decision from based on our understanding of the context. And that includes our experience. It includes our knowledge of the environment that we're in. And it includes the, the tactical and the technical options and the pedagogic options that we ha- have at our disposal. Um, so the, that that's the important point f- for me is that I'm not considering, I'm not trying to consider everything. I'm considering from probably four or five pre-selected options. So the, the example I'd give is um, if I'm out in the mountains in June in the UK, I don't have to consider snowpack because there is no snow. My, so I'm, I'm not making any judgments or calls based on that. However, if I was uh, in, in the Alps, I might encounter snowpack and I might have to then select from those options that include considering uh, what, how the snow will behave when I tread on it or ski on it. I don't know, Lowell. I gave a golf session on the 1st of June somewhere in Wales a couple of years ago and it snowed. But uh, <laughs> I hear what you're saying. No, a- absolutely. And, and I mean, boy, you know, we, we've opened up a whole new world there in terms of, um, you know, we could, we could further discuss that. What I'm hearing you both say, I, I want to draw to a close and um, um, ask a final question professional judgment and decision making um, is essential because um, you're in that swamp it's chaotic it's complex it's challenging it's difficult sometimes it's simple and 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 uh, and, and sometimes it's enormously challenging this is coaching um, and there what you're offering in a paper are three constructs that can potentially drive or guide you through your professional judgment and your decision making um i've really enjoyed reading the paper I, my last question is this and i'm going to come back to maybe something that i said earlier which is I, I would love to know your response or an idea of a response that you might give to somebody who might say hey guys i hear everything that you're saying here okay i kind of get you or i get you completely but you know what for me as a coach I need to be just games based. I want to be games based because, you know, that helps me feel comfortable. It helps me feel good. I want to learn all I can about games based. And that's the best way that I am going to be the best possible coach that I can be. What's your response to somebody who is saying that? And maybe it's somebody who's also saying, well, hang on a minute. Games based is pretty broad and pretty deep. And so, so subsequently, I'm going to really believe in this games-based approach. I'm going to learn everything I can, and that's how I'm going to be a coach. What, what's, what's, what's your response? 
I guess first things first, and this is what I was going to draw on before, is this idea that if we if we particularly take a view mm. and only pick one tool that, or method that we're really going to hit home, and we research that method, that I, I would suggest, first of all, that's good practice to mm. find out everything that you can know about that particular method. However, what co- really comes to the fore is if we, if we uh, only engage in that one particular method, what else are we missing? It comes back to that inattentional blindness piece. Okay. Uh, and if I have a preference and a bias towards that method of practice, it also prevents the ability to engage in metacognition about other possible options that are available to me. So if, if, I, if I constrain my, my worldview and I constrain my vision, my hearing, my feeling to this particular way of doing something, what else am I missing out on simply by the bias that I've created in that particular area? And I guess you said there, what conversation would I have with that person? Well, first things first is well. Okay, through the game, what what is the game based practice not allowing you to achieve? Because if they turn around and say we're achieving everything, well, I'd question that initially. But interestingly, it's it's what's missing. What to, what things aren't being achieved in your intentions for impact, and how else could you have been doing that? What other methods are available to you that might have been more time efficient, that might have been more inspiring for the athletes in terms of their motivation? What did the athletes want and need? And it's it's almost building it back out away from that single method to look back at the context and the environment and what that is demanding at that particular time. So is it, in other words, it's almost getting someone to think about their thinking in that moment to, to ask the question, what other way could I have done it? And why did I decide on the way that I did? I don't know if that answers the question. Well? Um, uh, I, it won't surprise you. I, I might take a slightly di- different view, um, but that, that, that's the joy of, uh, of working with, with Mike. Um, for me, cl- clearly the, co- the coach will have a set of beliefs and values that that will guide their coaching practice that you know there, there's a, a very clear and demonstrable link between their beliefs and values and their practice uh, and coaches tend to be very effective when that link is very clear they tend to become very stressed and have a very hard time when that that link can't be um can't be made um what we find is that coaches with sophisticated views of teaching and learning and good coaching practice typically apply a very broad range of different strategies. They're not fixed in, in a particular uh, area. Uh, now, they may, they may have a preference. They may like a particular approach, but they deviate from their approach when it's appropriate and when it's suitable. But then they recognize, they have the skills that recognizes, allows them to recognize that they have their particular preferences in the first place. So if I was having this conversation, I'd want to find out from that coach whether they did actually find the golden bullet. Because if they have, fantastic, actually. If they haven't, it's a question of then working with them in a in a way that allows them to have their beliefs and values, but to also delve into these other areas when it's appropriate and when it's suitable for the benefit of the person that they're coaching. If I could just add on there, I think that's excellent, Lowell. I guess it, it really resonated with it. If we, we draw on Sean's work earlier around being reflective in, reflective on, but interestingly, he did some work with Chris Argyris around this idea of spouse theories and theories in use. How, how, so I might have beliefs and values that I believe that I use. How much are they actually playing out in practice? And how much opportunity as a practitioner do I give myself to really explore whether I've played out my beliefs and values? And it's that that is so powerful for future practice. 
exploring that gap that can really drive forward where we go next. And you know what? If those two things are well aligned and their beliefs and values do play out in practice and they're working towards their intentions for impact, that is the essence of PJDM. Well done. Credit to you. And I, I think that is very much where we'd come from as a collective lol. If you correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not correcting you. I agree with you. Vigorously agreeing as ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is with agreement that we'll finish on. So uh, fantastic. Brilliant. Um, gents, I can't thank you enough for that conversation. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, probably leaves me with more questions. Lots of answers, but lots of questions as well, which is you know what this podcast is all about um so thank you so much for that conversation uh, and thank you so much for this um uh, piece this research um let's finish um on finding out how people can contact you uh, or follow your work um and find the paper um uh, lowell will you like to go first how can uh, I know you're on Twitter. Um, how can people find you? If you want to be contacted, how can they contact you? And, and perhaps you can tell us how, how they can uh, find this paper. Um, so the, the paper is, uh, is available. Um, we've, uh, we've put that out on Twitter. Um, easiest place to contact me is either through University of Edinburgh um, or through Grey Matters. Uh, which are the, the, the two organisations that I, I principally work for uh, at the moment. Okay, perfect. And um, Mike? Uh, literally exactly the same, uh, you know, either through the University of Edinburgh and Grey Matters as well. And it's the, the, the paper is open access, isn't it, at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Is there a specific yeah. website people can jump onto to, to find it? We, if we share the DOI link, yeah. um, it's with Sports Coach and Review, but we'll share it with you so you can distribute that. We'll stick it in the in yeah. the show notes. Um, brilliant, gents. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Well, everybody, I really enjoyed that podcast and I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website danabrahams.com to tell me what you think of the show i'd be delighted to hear any thoughts or suggestions that you have i'm already looking forward to next week's episode bye for now